Okay, so what, what we want to do is um, we want to establish what is our responsibility with regards to the 4th of July as a public holiday, and are there any halachic implications from that perspective of, um, and in general, with regards to public holidays, are there any halachic prohibitions and, um, or obligations, right? And is it one of those, once again, one of those delicate balances that one needs to walk um, with regards to how one can do it. <clears throat> so we, we start off with, well, let's, let, let's throw it out. What, what do you guys say? What would be a problem of celebrating the 4th of July? Let's, let's go with, let's start with, you know, I think last week it worked really well when, when we started with the extreme and they kind of like enabled us a lot of balance. So let's start with the more extreme, uh, more extreme uh, case. And that would be, um, may one celebrate Christmas. Stuart, you're on. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm probably a mute. I mean, not what we can see of you, but it's good to see you You're with us. Well, there aren't many, so I'm glad I'm around for today. Okay, so what do you think? What would happen if the 4th of July is on Shabbos? Okay, well, I mean, what would happen if the 4th of July is on Shabbos? What's the 4th of July is always, they, if they made it the national holiday, the Mondays. It's always the Monday. uh, no, that's not true. No. Not if the, the 4th of July could come out on a Wednesday, Alan. Yeah, it could, but yeah. well, yeah, the 4th of July, they just 4th of July, right. 4th of July. Yeah, 4th of July, 4th of July. Some of the other days, it came Monday. I can't get the glare out. Well, 4th of July on Shabbat. Well, I, I, I didn't even start. Go with Christmas? I, I want to start with Christmas, because I think Christmas, Christmas starts... Enough. Christmas is a no, and why is Christmas a no? Well, Christmas is a Christian holiday. It is yeah. not a, we happen to get the day off because of the dominance of the Christian majority creating that holiday, but it's not, uh, it's not a public holiday in the sense of 4th of July or others, or even, yeah, 4th of July. Okay, well, let's forget, let's leave the 4th of July for a minute. Let's okay. Christmas, specifically Christmas, about Christmas. Is a Christian everyone holiday. agree that Christian is, the Christmas is, is a Christian holiday, and therefore what? And therefore we do not celebrate it. We do not celebrate it. Is it prohibited to celebrate it? Yes. Yes, why? The uh, Avodazar. Avodazar. What is Avodazar? It's, uh, no, I'm saying which part of it is Avodazar? That Avodazar if, meaning if, idol worship. If you... Um, get rid of the presence and the Santa Claus and all that stuff and get to the basics of yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It would be Jesus Christ on that holiday is uh, God in the Christian community or a one, you know, one of the three representations of God or the representation of God on earth as a man or the person who's sacrificed by God for uh, for the original sin or how much theology what is get the to... problem with it I understand that is not a Jewish concept now is there a halachic issue with that so clearly a vote Zar is not it I didn't <laughs> well, say it's would, not well, it's well, sticking not. with the vote Zar it's sticking with the vote is I don't worship so he's saying that um, uh, Len is is saying that there is an issue with regards to idol worship uh, with regards to celebrate, celebrating excellence. Okay, fine. Leave it at that. What about January 1st? That's the bris. That's the bris. January 1st is... Uh, I would say it's fine. It's the unwritten fifth New Year that should have been in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, but they just didn't think of it which is a, the, the civil year. And the civil year that's in Rosh Hashanah is uh, 
um, can be applied to the civil society that you live in. So I'm going yes. Good. Yeah. It's not the yes. New Year of the Trees. What do you think, Brad? I think New Year's is fine. It's a New Year's holiday. It's, it's not. A, it's, it's not, not a, a Christian holiday. Well, I think what what we want to pull is: is it a religious holiday or not? No, I don't think it's religious. But Christmas is. I do not think so. Who's that? Never thought of New Year's as a uh, Christian. It's, you know, we live in a year. Um, only recently did I begin thinking of Jewish New Year's. So my entire youth growing up, New Year's was an exciting day. And it was just a day we all celebrated. Never thought of it as a religious day of any religion. Um, okay. I didn't think I was breaking any laws by, by celebrating New Year's. As long as you weren't driving while you're drinking. Uh, I've been known to do that, but maybe <laughs> just one, maybe just one drink. Just one. Ex except if it, you're at the L'Chaim Center, then it's always ah, more than one drink. Okay, what about Thanksgiving? So if we're good with New Year's, We'd be good with Thanksgiving. Is that right? Thanksgiving is more problematic. Thanksgiving is more problematic. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think it's problematic <laughs> depending on uh, how you, what your belief system is as a Jew. Um, if you're an Orthodox Jew, maybe it's problematic. I, I'm sure if you're a Reformed Jew, it, it's not even an issue. <laughs> okay, I'm not going. No, we're not going. We're, not go, we're just. We're just. You're not going. Logically, Thanksgiving uh, does. Um, if you go to the original intent, yeah, of the Thanksgiving, you know, if you're an originalist, right, then I think Thanksgiving had a religious aspect to it. They were coming here to create a new Zion. And it was a religious mission. And this was the Thanksgiving uh, first moment of thanks, probably related to Jesus, um, given their background, uh, to thank uh, God. Um, but so I think it's I think it's more problematic a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. I think it's, it's in between the, the clarity of. Christian, uh, Christmas and the clarity of New Year's in my mind. Thanksgiving. Right. So, I, I, and I like how this is going. So, I mean, what I found just like practically out of um, these past two classes is when we are faced with a halakhic challenge, what it really helps is to go to the extreme and define what is the problem with Christianity, with X, let's just call it X. Now, what is the problem with Xmas? <clears throat> and if our issue with Xmas is, um, is because it is a religious holiday, then celebrating it would be wrong. Then would that come across with regards to something that is also a religious holiday, but not necessarily such a religious holiday, not necessarily clearly celebrating a, a Christian event, right? right? Yep. And then right. we can also find um, a more, more, if that is so, then really what is going on on New Year's? Is it a religious holiday? Is it not a religious holiday? How do we view that? Okay, so let's, let's look at the verse. Let's go straight to the Torah. Torah says in, uh, in Leviticus, Vayikra Yudchet. Uh, I, I have to make sure I got it right. Vayikra Yudchet Gimel. Leviticus 18, verse 3. And the, verse, the Torah says as follows, Kama'asei Eretz Mitzrayim, as the actions of the land of Egypt, Asher Shaptim, by which you have lived over there, lo ta'asu, you shall not do. As the actions of the land of Egypt, which you have dwelt over there, you should not do. 
and the actions of the people in the land of Canaan, which I will bring you there, over there you should not do those actions. And in their ways or in their statutes, you should not walk. Okay. What does it mean um, in their statutes, you should not walk? That is going to be our discussion for tonight. Of what does it mean? What What are the categories of uh, statutes that are not allowed to be followed? I actually want to see if I can pull out this source. Okay. I don't have that. Okay. So, and there's, there's a Gemara in Chulin, there's a Talmud tractate that says, if a person does walk in the, in the, in the, in the laws, if a person does action and do these actions or follow in their path, one needs to check whether this person really has Jewish roots with it. Okay, very strong, very strong statement. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go straight to the the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch. In Kitsur Shulchan Aruch, he goes through a whole series of what is considered the Chukot HaGoyim, the, the, the laws of the, of the non-Jews, statutes of the non-Jews, okay? And it's important to start where, first of all, what is, what is happening over here is that it does not seem that the prohibition is about connect attached to the, the, the serving of idols. It does not seem that there, the Torah has an issue of with regards to serving the idols. The Torah has got a specific action of do not behave in their ways. Be different, okay? Um, <clears throat> the next verse actually says, you shall do my action, you should do my laws, my statutes, and follow my statutes in or and go in their way. I am Hashem your God in my in my ways. Meaning there are those ways and there's my ways and I want you to follow my ways and not meaning be different. The goal over here clearly seems to be that there needs to be a differentiation between the Jew and the non-Jew. Okay, that's the Torah obligation. Okay, in the Kitsu Shulchan Aruch, he goes through the Code of Jewish Law, the summary of the Code of Jewish Law was written by Rabbi Yitzchak Gansfried. He lived in the, the early, early 1900s, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, he summarized the entire Code of Jewish Law called the Kitsu Shulchan Aruch. And he, he went very, 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 he took a very strong stance. And um, it's also important, in my opinion, to know the environment that they were living in. Okay, so Ritzchak Hansfried, he, he lived in Europe in the late 1800s. So he's taking this to a very strong stance. He goes as follows. One is not permitted to go in the, in the, war, to, to go in the ways of the idol worshippers, and we do not behave similar to them, not in the way of their dress or of their hair, and similar to that. As it says, you should not go in the, in the, in the path of the idol worshippers. And it also says, uh, mm -hmm. look, right. and it says, be, whole, be very careful, whether, whether you, that you don't get pulled after them. You should not wear clothes that are, clothes that are unique to them, mm -hmm. Certain clothes of high people that show um, uh, uh, a huge self esteem. What's the word? Arrogance. Arrogance, thank you. Uh, uh, clothes that show arrogance, one should not wear. For example, that which we saw in, um, in, uh, in the Talmud that says, even with regards to the shoelace the strap of the shoe, that if it was the Jewish way and the non-Jewish way, the, the way of the idol worshiper to tie their shoe in a certain way 
and the way of the Jew is different, or it was their behavior, their custom to wear red straps and the Jew wore black ones because black shows with uh, uh, a behavior of uh, humility and loneliness. It is prohibited for a Jew to change. And from this we learn, just got cut off, call Adam, from here, each person should learn. This that was the, the quote of the Talmud. Every person should learn according to his way and according to his hour. That clothes that are made for arrogance and immodesty, immorality, immo immodesty. A person, a Jewish person, should not behave like that. Rather, his his clothes should be made um, that express humility and modesty. I'm not speaking at all about women, but just in general, a person's clothing should be in this, in this way. Um, and then the, he, he brings a quote, which was a very interesting quote, that mm -hmm. the Talmud, there's, a, there's an argument between Rabbi Yehuda and in the Talmud of Sanhedrin, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbanan, with regards to how a certain behavior was was meant to was meant to sorry, give me a second. Good teenagers. Okay, uh, with regards to certain. Uh, a behavior of actually how how they used what how the death penalty was 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 installed how they did the death penalty the rabbanon said it is done in the same way that the public uh, that the non-jews will do will fulfill the, the death penalty rabbi huda said no it has to be done differently and rabbi huda said to the to the sages i understand that this is not an appropriate way of doing the death penalty he said with a cleaver it was a question of using uh, how they how they performed the death penalty where they used it with a sword. And Rabbi Huda said you, they would use a cleaver. Rabbi Huda said, "How can I? What can I say? I know that this is not an appropriate way of fulfilling the death penalty. But what can I say? The Torah says you should not walk in the way. And therefore, when one talks about putting someone to death, has to be has to be different to the behaviors on the of the non Jews. And um, He asks, why is it that it seems to be that in some cases, Rabbi Huda says, we have to walk with the path of, we have to walk very differently to the non-Jews. And then other times it's not so. And therefore he's stuck and he answers as follows. There are two types of the law of the non-Jew. Meaning there's one law that is being done by the non-Jew as a, as a path of idol worship. And one that they just do with regards to uh, frivolity and, um, and nothingness that they have. So meaning there, there are behaviors that the non-Jew will do and that is associated to idol worship, okay? And then there are other behaviors that are not, that have no association to idol worship. It's just different, okay? So he says, when we have behaviors that are established that are similar to idol worship, then that has to be differentiated and that falls under the category of you should not go in the path. However, if it is merely an action that has no religious association, then that doesn't have that, extreme uh, responsibility of not going in the way. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What happens if the Gentile, the other ways they started adap uh, adapting, adopting the ways the Jews did it? Hmm. Should, they, should they change Such it? Such a then? great question. Such a great question. The question is, did you guys hear it online? What if, what, what if 
what if that, I mean, this is this is such an important fundamental that we are not familiar with? What if non-Jews began taking on Jewish behaviors as a religious experience, as a religious service? Is that right? Okay. So, can I borrow your Tanakh for a minute? Of course. <laughs> okay. Well, I know Shmuel base. So, um, oh, it's not Shmuel base. Malachim Aleph. Here we go. This is the time. The time is where. Um, well, let's start with this. How many times a year does the Jew get down on his knees? Any Jew? How many times a year does a Jew well, get? Your average Jew get down on his knees. The average Jew. Any Jew. Once, when? Okay. On Yom Kippur, right? And some on Rosh Hashanah, when we say Alein Rosh Hashanah. That was only the uh, Shemir Sabbath. Everyone goes down? Yes, some people. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's where I was going. That's why I said it. Oh, I see. I was going to say you. Yeah, I, I see. So I Fine. had that in mind, but I right. only our, our camp. Right. Only our camp. Right. Um, he does it twice. Alein is twice, I believe, on Rosh Hashanah. No, two days, I guess. Yes, yeah, right. Twice and five times on Russian, five times on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other time that a Jew will get down his knees? Never. Right. <laughs> Sorry, it's like he's like chopping. I'm, I'm in a class. You choose. Um, why not? Okay. Why not? It's a prohibition to get down on one knees and to, and to pray. In a prayer form, one is prohibited to do that. Right? Is this a new concept? That we never, we never bowed? No, because Moses... Uh, Moshe fell on his face and he bowed. Who else bowed? During the time of giving of the Torah, they bowed. Yeah. When anyone came up to the to the temple, they bowed. In uh, the Kohanim yeah. would bow. Uh, when a person brought a sacrifice, one would fall on his face and would bow. Yeah. Right. Numerous times we find this concept of bowing. So why don't we bow more often? Why don't we get down on our knees? Such a beautiful behavior. Yeah. It's probably related to um, right. uh, the. Uh, Time of uh, Islam's uh... Islam? No. no, that's not such a problem, because Islam are not do not have an issue of idol worship. It's not because of Islam; it's because it's of Christianity. Christianity. Correct. So once it became well, it became more of a pagan behavior before the development of Christianity. It's where it was it was it was completely broken off, and one is prohibited to bow down prohibited to get onto one's knees, okay? But it's very specific. The halacha is very specific on a wooden floor and a stone floor. That's where the prohibition is, okay? Um, and there are cases in the Talmud where um, in, in the Shemona Esrei at the time, in the time of the Talmud, during, they were down in Shemona Esrei, they would actually get down on their knees when they bow. When they say, Baruch Atah Hashem, they, they bow down onto the knees and fall flat. And there's a whole story where Rabbi Huda he came to sit in the synagogue and he didn't, and they asked him why not. It's a whole story. But um, so we have this concept where we see that when our behavior gets taken over by um, by a Christian by an idol worship behavior, we will take a step back in in order to avoid that mix, right? 
not only over there, um, the technique of prayer, technique of prayer was having praying with one's hands up like this. That was, that was the original technique of prayer. As we see, when King Solomon, he established, when he built the temple, when he built the base of Mikdash, it says, and Solomon stood in front of the altar of God, be, uh, opposite the entire Jewish nation, and he raised, he spread out his hands towards the heaven, and then he prayed, and he said, God, the God of Israel, there is no one like you in the heavens above, or the whole thing. And he goes this beautiful, beautiful prayer, the prayer that, um, the famous prayer of King Solomon. I told you about the book that I wanted to write one day. Maybe you'll help me write a book. I'm writing my own book. I got a great, great book, such so, a great book. So it's going to be a while. I so want to, to your book. Yeah. I want to write a book. I want to write a book and basically pull out every prayer that is in the Hall of Tanakh and go through it. Oh, that's a big project. Is that such a beautiful project? Yeah. We have from Eliezer or Abraham or whoever prayed. What was the prayer and the explanation of how we learn and what we learn from? Because you, you have an issue. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, so the yeah, understand. So originally, the original technique of prayer, how we would pray, and it's very important. I don't understand this, but my, but I heard that from a kabbalistic perspective, the ten the person's ten fingers connect and attach oneself to the heavenly spiritual expression of Hashem, and by praying like this. That, ex that enables the connection um, uh, from the ends of one's body to, for the blessing to come through and, and to, have that, to have that strong tether, right? So we, so, and yet we don't pray like that anymore. But I see, I see, I've seen some people that do pray that way. Not very many of them, but I've seen some. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen some My understanding is that as well. Okay. There is a part where Sephardim will go and say, at, in the middle of Ashrei, uh, will say, we open up your hands, and you satisfy and satiate all living beings. During that part, we'll open our hands like this, almost to receive the blessing of Hashem. That's, what, that's, a, that's the custom. But it's not to it's lift not, up the hands. It, so not that I don't receive it, yeah. but the, uh, when the cook, we call Panim come in front and cover themselves. Correct. And they do something that I've never seen right, it. Right, right. And you can right. look at them, by the way. If they're wearing a talus, you can watch. Oh, by the way, right. I know you didn't. I, I didn't know that either. So like if they're doing something, they're doing something with their hands. Okay, I'll explain what they're doing. And um, we're allowed to see this? I'm not a coin. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the technique. Oh, Stuart, you're a coin, right? Yeah, but leave it. You don't want to turn to me. <laughs> so, sir, you, you're, you're blessed. Trend, sir, sir. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek. So when a coin blesses, he, he will cover his head with a talus, and then he will have his hands like this, and his other hand like this, and they're together. And according to Kabbalah, um, his hands make the, the letters of Hashem. There's a yud, a hay, a vav, and a hay. I'm not exactly sure how that works. Yeah, and a hay. But the, the hands up is very common. The hands up. Is so, it in the evangelical. Evangelical, correct. Hands, correct. Not the right. So, but what's, what's happening, by the way, with the coin, with the coin, what's happening when they do that blessing is what we understand is what's happening is that the blessing, it's that God says, the Samuch me of B'nai Israel will place my name on the Jewish nation. I will bless them. So when the Jewish nation place the name of Hashem, meaning the blessings of Hashem on the Jewish nation, when they say, what happens, what we see 
is what happens is the blessing of Hashem comes and through the hands of the coin okay. and they get spread in, across the, the congregants. And by the way, it's important to note that one should always make sure that one is standing in front of the coin, not to the side, not behind mm -hmm. or whatever, behind, you know, mm -hmm. that they're facing the coin and not in front of, not in an area where the hands are not there. And then when they say Yivarecha, when any letter, any word that ends with Cha, well, they're meant to swing. Yivarecha, mm -hmm. it should, God should bless you. Yivarecha. So they spread it across the entire community to cover it. Okay, so we did that in depth, understanding that number one, um, we're, we don't behave like the non-Jews. We have to be different. Number two, we established that um, there are behaviors of arrogance and behaviors of immodesty that will fall under this category. Number three, we also see that there are behaviors that are associated or attached to religious behavior to, sorry, no religious behavior, idol worship behavior or is attached to idol worship. And then there are others that are not attached to idol worship. And um, according to the kids of Shulchan, he seems to split that those which are attached to idol worship are prohibited, those which are not, are not necessarily prohibited. Okay. And I need a plug for my computer. Rabbi, going back, Going back to number one, yeah. as you as you describe it, it seems to me that it's um, a basic cause of anti-Semitism that uh, the Gentiles think that the Jews feel that they're above them and they don't want to act like them, they don't want to look like them, they don't want to walk like them. Um, these are the these are just personal behaviors. What about um, what about the laws the laws of the country? Um, are Jews obligated to uh, to follow them as opposed to just the the customs of of the non-Jews? You ask you ask a very good question. Are we instilling anti-Semitism or not? Did I scare you off? <laughs> Apparently, you're taking over the class, Alan. You're not. <laughs> Chair Allen. Oh, no, he's back. Now. Okay, so Alan is asking, what about the issue of anti-Semitism? If we're behaving differently, if we choose to be different to the non-Jews, is that not caused causative of anti-Semitism. Okay, let's talk about the opposite. What happens if you behave exactly like a non-Jew in every way? Then you begin threatening them that you're going to be taking over their... No, you don't their, need to them. And, and that's, you know, that's why if, if you assimilate too much, uh, then, you, then you start scaring everybody, and they want to kick you out. I would. I, I don't know if that, if that would be, that would come. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I haven't done this. I haven't studied anti-Semitism to enough of a degree to to go that far to say that if we start assimilating, then they'll kick us out. But definitely, there there is a, there is a goal of a Jew, right? And the Jew needs to achieve a certain goal. When the Jew begins to assimilate, what ultimately we are stuck with is assimilation, the problem of assimilation, and then the Jew is not fulfilling his job. And then what is society left with, if not for the Jew? But I, I just think uh, the chosen people, just that phrase began anti-Semitism right there. Uh, if we were chosen, that means maybe everyone else is inferior to us. It's yeah. an interesting statement, but anti-Semitism kind of started before the concept of the chosen people and that. Like, and, 
it, it was the first time the first time we find anti-Semitism is during the expression of Pharaoh to his advisors. You don't think so? When Amalek attacks. Oh, oh, Pharaoh, sorry, 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 sorry. Wrong, hey, you were in that's okay. Hang yes. on, B'nai Israel, yes, yes, the Jewish yes, yes, nation, sorry. the Jewish nation are many, let us control them. Yes, yes, yes. So That's my Rebbe used to say, my Rebbe used to say that what, what, um, with the birth of the Jewish nation, in B'nai Israel, the first time we were identified as a nation, anti-Semitism was born at the same time. Yeah, if you parse those verses, it's exactly... You label them the other, you get the rest of the community to help oppress them. It's like a standard play. It's a play. Okay. So no. Those verses. Yeah. Correct. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I think you're, you're asking, you, you're, we're, we're, we're going down a great line of like, what, what about repercussions of not, not going in that, not going in that way, right? What, what happens? in uh if if we if we behave differently it, it's a very interesting topic because i was actually listening to a podcast with um one i think he was he was the cfo of merrill lynch and uh he's an orthodox guy and um he was talking about the importance of relationships and the importance of attending um Christmas parties, Xmas par parties, how you go about doing that, and whether, and he said in New York, many, many, many of the Christmas parties that they that he attends, they have specifically have kosher food there. Because mm -hmm. uh -huh. there are, they know so many, so many Orthodox people are attending. And he he's very specific about how the prohibition of, of drinking alcohol there's an issue. I, it, he said, the way he puts it is, there is, um, the way he put it was, one, there's a prohibition of drinking wine in a party with non-Jews. That's a prohibition. The question is, drinking alcohol at a party with non-Jews, and he said, it may be, you, it may be halakhically permitted, but it's absolutely forbidden. Mm -hmm. And the way he put it, I mean, he has horrendous, horrendous stories ultra orthodox women who um she went to a party and she, she she had a very low alcohol tolerance and she um her friends started to drink and drink she woke up the next morning in a bed you guys and she was married to a coin married to a coin like like extreme challenges, a lot of challenges. But um, so the way he put it, I, I wish I had, I, I don't have his name in front of him. Um, maybe I can give you his name. Uh, but the way he put it was that there are, there are two behaviors. There's the behavior of, um, there's the behavior of Sorry, Meridian. C Ralph Hertzka, CEO of Meridian. That's it. That's who it is. Um, so there's the there's the there's there's the issue of, of being able to attend a party, of of being at a party and making sure that you're you're seen at a party because it's important for relationships. And then at the same time, one needs to walk a delicate balance of not falling behaving like them, of it's turning into a party where it's just partying. That's that's the way he put it. Okay, um, what I want to do is I want to try and get to, how are we doing with time? We've got 15 minutes. What I want to do is I want to try and get towards the, um, the concept and trying to get our, to ourselves to Thanksgiving and then to the 4th of July. Um, the Orch of Sadiqim, which is the Musa Saver, he says, with regards to, and you shall not go in the path of the, the non-Jews in the walks of the, and in their walks, you should not go. And it says, be careful 
uh, if one is not careful, you may fall after them. Everything is being warned about one specific area. That a Jew should be different in his behavior, in his dress and his speech. And all of his behaviors from those who are idol worshippers, as it says. And I have, as God said, I've, I've separated you from those non-Jews, which means that we have an obligation to behave differently, okay? We have an obligation to behave differently. Now, you did ask about us becoming um, more hated by behaving differently. I honestly, my personal belief, and I've, 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 I've walked into hundreds, hundreds of Christian homes and never in my, and never thought ever to take up my yarmulke, never thought of taking my tzitz, of packing my tzitzes in. My tzitzes always stick out, always wear my yarmulke. I've never, never been looked at downwards because of how I dress, that I'm dressed as an Orthodox person, never. Um, it is a double-edged sword in that when I get frustrated, I'm missing a flight, or they kick me off a flight, or whatever, and then give me the seat on the flight, or whatever it is, and I get frustrated, and, and I'm not able to balance my emotions well, that I'm wearing a yarmulke. I have my sister's hat, and that is opening a door for something that's very dangerous. Um, okay, with regards to behaviors of a non-Jew, it's very important to know that um, so let's just talk about, it it's spoke a little bit about clothes, spoke a bit about um, uh, things that the idol worshippers have. So he says, um, the, the, this is the Shulchan Aruch, he says, What should not dress the clothes that are unique to them. Should not grow the corners of the head like they do. And we should not shave from the sides and leave the hair in the middle. Like he's talking about like the priests mm -hmm. would have the rounded uh, what's up? Um, and one should not build places like their halls of that they make for the idol worship. They see comes to them, Rabbim said, many people gather over there like they do. Elihe moved on the hand, but Bush a person should be different from idol worshippers in one's dress and in the rest of one's behaviors. All of these prohibitions are only with regards to behaviors that the non-Jews began to behave from a perspective of immorality. For example, they started wearing immoral clothes. In those days, it was red. Or arrogant clothes. Clothes that are very attract, uh, attracting. However, things that they have begun to take on, which are practical, which have uses. For example, a person who is a doctor, who is a specialist, he had unique clothes. He had special clothes that it was seen, clearly seen, that this is a person who is a doctor, who is a professional. Those clothes one may wear. Meaning, if it is just for perspective of arrogance or perspective of idol worship, there's a prohibition. However, if there's a practical uniform that expresses what a person does, that is permitted. Chenk Josem Mishum Kavad Tamar. Fine, he's brilliant. Um, okay. So now, with regards to 
Christmas, Xmas. אם בכוונה מחמס שהוא יום אידסר מדינה ואם בלא כוונה יש לעשר מצד מרסה. He said with regards to, um, okay, cool. The question that came to Rav Moshe Feinstein was, you, your, your daughter got engaged and you got a hall, you got a wedding hall on uh, the, only, the only availability was on December 25th. Can you make a party? Can you make a wedding, an engagement party over a mitzvah on that specific day? On December 25th? Correct. 24th, 25th, I don't know it's which day. Not Shabbat. As long as it's not Shabbat, there's no problem. So he says, with, even if it's not, uh, not intentional, one should be careful with this from a perspective of Marisai with regards to Nektava, meaning what, what people walking by may see that there's a big party going on over here, and you know, this, Jew, this Jewish guy has got, is celebrating Christmas. He's got a Christmas party. Men doesn't like that. Vesudas mitzvah kamila upitana bain yesh la asot afilu. So now you ask, what about a, a bris miller or a pigeon a bain which are required on a specific day? Um, So it is missing from the middle of Yes, last of Philu BMA HLM. Doesn't matter. You can even do it on a day of celebration for the non Jews, the idol worship. Then I have some Shul Maris Ein, Suda Sam Chiebs. There's no prohibition of uh, having, it's seemingly you're doing something wrong if you have an obligation to do that. Right? So you, we have an obligation to make a Suda. Uh, a, a celebration, a meal, celebratory meal on a day of the bris. So if you have a celebration of the, on the day of the bris, so even if it's on December 25th or 24th, it doesn't matter. It's got nothing to do with, you have an obligation, we have an obligation, that obligation pushes away a bit in the, in the perspective of Um Aval Sudas bar mitzvah tov li trot al yom acher. Bar mitzvah when you preferably push it off a day. And even a wedding, ideally a wedding one should push off and rather do it on a different day. And the first day of their year, the first day of their year, meaning uh, New Year's, the chain, tanks given. Got to hit Tet Ein Nun Kupsa. Thanksgiving, Gimel Yud Vav Vav Yud Nun Gil. Ein Le Sor Medina, when should not prohibit us from a halachic perspective, meaning um, to make celebration on those days. Bali Nefesh Yush Yesh Lam Lach, when certain people should be more stringent from that perspective. Okay? Um, now, um, it was the opinion of Rabbi Salavaj that it was permissible to eat turkey at the end of November on the day of Thanksgiving. We understood that in his opinion, there was no question that turkey did not lack a tradition of kashras and that eating it on Thanksgiving was not a problem of imitating gentle customs. We also heard that this was the opinion of his father, Rabbi Moshe Salavaj. And apparently, Rabbi Yashavir Salavaj, he used to give shear earlier that day and end his shear early on Thanksgiving so that guys could go back to their Thanksgiving Thanksgiving dinner. Watch football. Watch football. Um, so Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, he went further and um, with regards to establishing a day in the year to celebrate a certain celebration he thinks is not appropriate. And and it's not appropriate, and there's an issue of adding on more celebrations than what the Torah has given us. Rather, one should be more stringent with that. Okay. Um,
So he wants to go into, Ramon Feinstein wants to go into and explain what is the real halachic issue with regards to Thanksgiving. So on, one, on the one hand, Thanksgiving is associated to a religious holiday because it was a day where they gave thanks to God. So now he says like this, uh, with regards to participating in the day of Thanksgiving, like to make, to celebrate it and to make a party, to make a meal. In those, in their, in the laws of their religion, this day is not celebrated or is not mentioned as a day of celebration or a holy day. And it is not obligated, one is not obligated in their laws or in their religious laws to participate in this day with a meal. And since it is merely a day of remembrance that of the people of the founders, that they also celebrated that the country which they came to live here and we don't find, we therefore don't find any prohibition within this, nor making a meal, nor eating the hodu, the indic, indic, by the way, is a turkey. Look at the matzinu. Uh, okay. <laughs> I should not be making this this day as an obligatory day of celebration. That we as Jews should not be saying this has to be done by everyone. It is a day that you, if you wish to participate, it is a good thing to participate. Um, as long as it's not established as an obligatory day, one can celebrate it the next year or the next year. In fact, some people actually say that one should, every so often, one should skip the turkey one year so one doesn't show that this has become a <laughs> holiday. Um, Rabbi. Um, Rabbi David Cohen said, in my opinion, to eat turkey for the sake of a holiday is prohibited by the rule of Tosus of Bodhisar, since this is an irrational rule of theirs and following it is improper. That's Rabbi David Cohen, who's, who's actually a Talmud, a student of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Um, anyways, um, Rabbi Hutner took it to the extreme, saying that this is Thanksgiving is a Gentile holiday and one is prohibited to be involved at war. Rabbi Salavaychik permitted the celebration, even eating turkey. He ruled Thanksgiving is not a religious holiday and so no problem with it. And Moshe Feinstein kind of found a middle ground where he does, discourages an annual celebration, but it's okay to participate in that. Now, that is with regards to Thanksgiving. Now, what about the 4th of July? With regards to the 4th of July, it seems that the 4th of July does not have any religious association to it at all. Merely what we have is the 4th of July is a celebration of a opportunity that we have, okay? That we, we're, that we have this uh, celebration of independence. That's really what it is, independence from, from the British Empire. Um, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein once said, he said, I would rather be a street sweeper in America where I would be able to learn Torah freely than a Rav in the Soviet Union suffering religious repression. And the importance of expressing gratitude is of fundamental importance. That is one of the reasons why I have my flag out there is that I feel it's an obligation or it's an obligation to express gratitude. And it's not necessarily that I'm celebrating something per se as much as importance of expressing gratitude. So Monday we should uh, say halal and go tachanum, right? Uh, you know, I'm willing to uh, let them both go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, adding halal to davening is a, is a challenge. It's right. not a simple thing to I be understand. able to add, add halal. Even in Israel, Independence Day is. <laughs> Even in Israel's Independence Day is, yeah. What about tachanum then? Would it be acceptable not to talk to on, on 4th of July? What is wrong Since with asking for forgiveness on 4th of July? 
But why do we do tacking? Why don't we do tacking on certain days? Because they're happy days or they're happy days, right? I don't know. Um, the Gemara and Brachas 19b rules that certain prohibitions regarding Kahanim uh, being metame, uh, allowing them to, be, to become impure on rabbinic issues, are set aside for the idea of Kavad Malchus out of honor of the empire, of the, of the ruling monarchy. And this concept was also behind the formation of the prayer known as Hanosein Teshua, the prayer that we say in honor of the government throughout the history, Torah Jews have always prayed for the welfare of their home state. It's important to express gratitude, especially to the United States. Experiments, the experiment that was the United States of America way back in 1776 was an experiment that changed the world. Can a democracy work? The rise of the country herald, heralded the demise of the age of absolutism and the accompanying suppression of religious freedoms that absolutism entails. The world is freer now because of the United States. They were the messengers that Hashem sent that allowed us the freedoms we enjoy, not just in this country, but throughout the world. In the, in the conservative movement, in our prayer books, yeah. we, Shabbat, we read a prayer for the country. So do we? So do we? Okay. So do we? Well, it's, 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 it's in the back. black book, it's not in the red book. It's not, right. It's not in uh, so, the art scroll. So there are two art scroll two editions. Scrolls. There's the OU edition and there's the regular edition. And it's in the OU edition. It's not in the regular edition. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't know how much. I, I think what we've got, to summarize, I think we've got a bit of clarity with regards, to, there are two parts with, um, with regards to the prohibition of celebrating with, with non-Jews. We have A the celebrations that are associated to a religious festival that is associated to idol worship, that that is something that is prohibited. Um, and then um, we also saw that there are behaviors that non-Jews have that are also prohibited with regards to their dress, arrogance, and immodesty, Im Im that that and, and talk and the way they talk, that also falls under the prohibition. And then we... Um, we came across and found a bit of middle ground with regards to Thanksgiving, which is, has some uh, religious associations. And we brought that then, we then brought that across to the 4th of July, which is clearly not a religious celebration, a religious celebration. But at the same time, it is a time where we express gratitude and gratitude is a major fundamental for Judaism. Injury. Excuse me. So then using that logic to say that the holiday of like Labor Day, Memorial Day, as the other days are, are okay to celebrate people. I would that agree. Like, as long as I would agree. As long as it's not a religious. Correct. Thing. Correct. Um, yep. Rabbi, two yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, July 3rd in Brickyard Park, down the hill on Cates, uh, there's a massive fireworks display that your kids uh, would love. Uh, look into that. They'll start at dusk or the, the dark, but it's fabulous. Number two, <clears throat> number two, regarding number one again, um, I can't get it out of my head that being different from the non-Jews is one thing. Being different from other Jews is a very destructive force. And I think one of the biggest things that we face as Jews are, you know, are the, are the totally different views unaccepted by each other uh, between the different types or feelings of Jews that, that maybe it's so ingrained in some of us to be different that we are expanding that to being different from other Jews. Interesting. I sounded like, that one. I sounded yeah. like Les Lawrence, I'm sorry. No. I'm not not even close, Alan. You said not it, not me. Close. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> Rabbi discussing July Fourth and the uh, what we're celebrating makes me at this stage right now. 
I just hope that uh, we can always celebrate July 4th and not be worried that we're losing our democracy. And um, this is a fear among many, many se senior citizens that I know. Mm. Um, we've lived through a number of wars and assassinations, depressions, and I never felt down on America in my life. But right now, uh, it's the biggest concern I've had in my 90 years on this planet. So that's just where I'm at this July 4th. You know, I dare, I want to say one, I just want to answer, say, say one thing to that, that the, the, when Trump was running for, for presidency, when Trump was running, uh, many, 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 many people said they were going, to, if he gets elected, they said that- They're going to move to Canada. <laughs> they're moving to Canada. Right? <laughs> very few people did. And it's very clear that the, the leader of a certain pack is not more powerful than the collective group of the nation. And um, I, I, I think that, you know, a, there are the, the founding fathers were very, uh, they were, in my opinion, they, was, they, were, they were instilled with a phenomenal wisdom um, of establishing a United States that is set up in such a way that no matter what happens, it's still going to be a very strong establishment. And I think that very, 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 very successful people chose not to move to Canada. Anyone, well, that, to that, anyone who, who ran to Canada is a very, very small minority very of small. people. I'm more concerned about the 25 to 30 percent of Americans who probably would vote for a dictator if they had a chance. So that's, that's, that's what makes me crazy. Yeah. We've just got too many Americans who, you know, don't believe in our freedom. Unless it's, I unless you're our, back in a uh, machine gun. I, I don't want to go there. Yeah. I, I'm leave it at that. I try and avoid uh, our right. Torah topics go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. As much as possible. Good, good decision, Rabbi Gotti. <laughs> with that, with that, I'm going to take a break and get something to eat. <laughs> I want to. I want to end up. I want to end up with one with one little piece over here. That go on, go on. Also, Slovakia used to say. He said like this. He said that had Abraham Avinu, oh, sorry, Adam, Adam, when he ate from the fruit, when he was given an out by God. Was given out by God. When God said, Where are you? Adam had two options. He could have said, I'm scared and I hid. Or I messed up. Or he could have said what he said. And he said what he said. And his words were, His words were, God, it's not my fault. It's your fault. The woman that you gave me. <laughs> He blamed it on others. And what the Alta Slobodka said is had Adam, it was Adam's lack of gratitude, his lack of gratitude that he had such a great opportunity. And instead of expressing gratitude, expressed, instead of seeing things and taking responsibility, he, he refused to express his gratitude and he threw it straight back at God's face. That is why he got kicked out of the garden of Eden. God gave him an act. God didn't, it wasn't automatic that immediately after the eight, they got kicked out. God said, where are you? What are you doing? He said, I'm hiding. I was scared of you. Why? What did you do? Did you eat from the tree? Adam says, yes, it's not my fault. It's your fault, Hashem. And that is why it's so important. In Judaism, in Judaism gratitude is a fundamental, major fundamental. We express a gratitude to our government for, the, for everything that they do. In fact, our sages, I mean, like I've seen letters of um, uh, 
citizens in European countries and in Spain, they still, even after the edict, even the edict of kicking out the entire community out of the country or out of the city, wherever it was, they still prayed for the welfare of their government. Still mm. prayed for the welfare of the government. Yeah. It's an obligation to pray for the welfare of our government. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it, it's an obligation that we see. And that's why we fly our flags on the front of the flag. Okay. Okay. Ladies, thank you so much for joining thank me. You. Thank you. My pleasure. Great job. Bye. Bye.